Greetings to one and all in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study, Come Prayer Meeting of Calvary Pandan BP Church. Let us begin this evening of praise, worship, and the study of God's Word with the singing of hymn 263, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. 263. Please stand. of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God, he whose word cannot be broken, formed thee for his own abode, on the rock of ages founded, what can shake thy sure repose? Walls surrounded, thou mayest smile at all thy foes. See the streams of living waters springing from eternal love. Well, supply thy sons and daughters, and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such a river ever flows their thirst to assuage? Grace which, like the Lord the Giver, never fails from age to age. Round its habitation hovering, see the cloud and fire appear for a glory and a covering showing that the Lord is near glorious things of thee are spoken Zion city of our God he whose word cannot 
Formed thee for his own abode. Let us pray. Almighty God, our gracious, loving, merciful, holy, heavenly Father, we come humbly before thy throne of grace and mercies, pleading for thy blessings to be poured down upon all of us, thy blood-bought children. Cleanse us and wash us, O God, of all our sins by the precious blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as we plead for thy Holy Spirit to be our teacher, to grant us illumination and understanding in the study of thy holy word. And help us, Lord, to not be hearers only, but doers of thy truth as well. Sanctify us by thy truth, for thy word is truth, helping us to conform more and more to the image of thy only begotten Son. We thank thee, Father, for the privilege of having direct access into thy holy presence because of the finished work of our Saviour, our great High Priest, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, seated at thy right hand, forever interceding for us. We thank thee, Father, for this privilege. Lead us, guide us, O Lord, helping us to pray always according to thy holy will and constrained by the love for our Saviour, always for thy glory. Forgive us, O Lord, of all our sins, and bless us tonight for Jesus' sake. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our study on the book of Haggai. Tonight we shall look at Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 9. Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 to verse 9. Please allow me to read to you from God's word. For thus said the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, said the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. Amen and amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. The title is, The Greater Glory of God's House Revealed. We all love things that are great and glorious. In sports, the best is always put on a pedestal, and there will be a lot of adjectives used to describe the great sportsman. Incredible, unbelievable, whatever the sports might be. The greatest, the tallest, the smallest. We love to glorify extremes. Anything that is in between would be considered as average and they will be normal. And nobody would like to glorify and boast and praise normality. In terms of buildings, it's the same. The tallest, the biggest, the most expensive, cars, everything that we touch, we create, we design. There will always be some that we will consider as glorious, great, the best. This is the nature of man. What we see, what we handle, and what we touch. And when you think of the Solomonic Temple, it was indeed beautiful, glorious, and great, just simply based upon words alone. The manner in which God described how Solomon built, the amount of gold, silver, timber, and how long it took him, and how many people were involved in terms of thousands, and the amount of gold that was spent in decorating it, the grandeur and the glorious building of Solomon's temple was stupendous. So much so when the Lord asked them through Haggai, any of you could recall and remember what it was like? They wept, they cried, because compared to the first temple, this existing one that was yet to be built, based upon the completed foundation alone, they would all realize that it was nothing compared to the Solomonic Temple. 
And yet the Lord uh, revealed to them that this building that you are about to build, that you are all convicted and challenged to want to build, it is going to be, what God said, greater in glory than the former. Greater in glory than the former. And the Lord gave us three arguments to demonstrate how this second temple will be greater in glory than the Solomonic temple. And so from verse 6, we see the first argument. And it is the argument of the universal perspective. For thus said the Lord of hosts, now you know the phrase, thus said the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts, keeps repeating throughout these few verses. So it is not just Haggai that is speaking, it is the creator of heaven and earth, the one living and true God, the glorious God, our gracious, merciful, heavenly Father. It is Him who is now presenting to us the three arguments. And so the first is, yet once it is a little while. What does it mean, yet once it is a little while? In other words, the Lord here says, once more, once more, and in a short while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. So this is a universal perspective. So once more implies that there was some event in the past that the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, right? Jehovah, that's the name of the Lord. He did something that was similar to what he is now referring to regarding this second temple. Can you remember one activity that the Lord did in the past? That the Lord shook the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the dry land. The Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments were given to Israel and to all of us. Do you know how great the Ten Commandments are when God gave it to mankind? Men did not know how great sinners they are without the Ten Commandments. Do you know that? Before the Ten Commandments were given, even when God's people sinned against a fellow human being, they did not know that it was also a transgression against God. They did not know that when they lie, I just only lie to you. In what way have I sinned against God when I just lie to you? There is no nation, no country would ever have this idea, this understanding that it was also a transgression against God. Adultery. I just simply committed a sin against my wife. How is it a sin against God Almighty? I just committed a sin against my wife whom I have entered into by way of a marriage covenant. And that's it. But the moment God gave us the Ten Commandments, every transgression, including the desire, covetousness, is also a transgression against God. You just imagine how stupendous that revelation is, and God spent many chapters in the New Testament to explain to us the purpose of the Ten Commandments, to drive us to God in Christ. That's the purpose. It's a school teacher to point out to us how sinful we are, like a school teacher, educating us, teaching us, so that we will not find out that we are great sinners before God when we die and be cast into hell. By then it's too late. By then we can't get out of hell. But with the Ten Commandments, we know while we are still alive that we can still do something about it by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we will not need to die in our sin and be cast into hell. Because sin against a fellow human being can be reconciled between the two persons. But the moment we realize that my sin against you is also a sin against God, I may have reconciled with you, but I, how am I going to reconcile with God? There is no way I can make any reconciliation to God. What can I give to Him? Even if I say, I want to give you my life as payment for the sins I committed against you, God says, I gave you your life. Without me, you don't exist. How can you give to me what I give to you? 
You have nothing. That's how we are driven to God in Christ. And so the Lord says, this second temple doesn't have the external glory, but it also has a universal perspective that you must never, never forget. It will impact the universe. Whenever a saint, a child of God, becomes a Christian, did the Bible not reveal to us that the angels in heaven rejoice? One day you and I will dwell in heaven because of Jesus Christ. The universal impact. This temple must be completed because the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible already prophesied that he will enter the temple at the age of 12. He can't do that. That cannot be fulfilled if there is no temple. They must finish this temple. A universal perspective was how the Lord wanted them to realize, see beyond the gold, the bricks, the mortar, the stone, the wood, the timber, the external, the three-dimensional. See the universal impact that this temple will have. And that's what they must realize and understand. That even though it may not be as grand, as great, as precious, as brilliant, as golden as the first, do not see this as insignificant. The second argument, that it is greater in glory than the first temple, you see in verse 7, the glorious desire. I will shake all nations. The Ten Commandments shook the whole nation of Israel only. That was the first. The mountain shook. God appeared. God spoke for the first and only time to the nation as a whole. And the nation of Israel was, the people of Israel was so fearful, frightened, saying to God, don't speak to us directly anymore. But this, the Lord said, I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. In the case of Israel, the Ten Commandments, Israel came. All who dwell in Israel will come. But this is global. You see how great and how grand that is? The greatness of the global desire. You and I are spoken of in verse 7. Do you know that? This desire that you have to approach God in Christ, the desire that you have to one day stand in the new heaven and new earth, the desire that you have for all things according to scriptures, is found in verse 7. Verse 7 is a description of all of us who are truly born again in Christ. Just imagine that. And I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. A glory that you and I know is going to be far more stupendous and greater. In the case of Mount Sinai, it was dark, it was fearsome, it was frightening. Lightning, thunder, the voice of God was loud and it was awesome. But this would be grand and glorious. Why? Because it is salvation. The law was given to condemn, to show us how great sinners we are. But this temple where the Lord Jesus Christ himself at the age of 12 will set foot in, it is going to be a temple where the Lord Jesus Christ will enter. This is the temple. Of course, it will be very, very fancifully renovated, which took more than 40 over years by King Herod. Someone asked last week whether it was completely destroyed, leveled, and then rebuilt? My guess is maybe. We do not know. Because the Temple Mount that we now see in the new, or in the Jerusalem that we visit, that we visited, was definitely put there by Herod. Herod was the one who did it. Now, whether he retained the same structure and then renovated all the areas around it, or demolish it and then rebuild it. I don't believe that they 
demolish it, I think, I'm not sure, no, no record. Because I don't think the Jews will allow them to allow Herod to demolish it. That's my guess. Because it's holy. You demolish the holy place and the most holy place without God's instruction and command. Even uh, the Sanhedrin council who are unbelievers, I don't think they would allow it. So maybe they will decorate and renovate all the surrounding areas rather than the actual temple itself. But this would be the place where the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his incarnate state would set foot in. Jesus did not do that in the case of the first temple. The glory is the presence of the second person of the Godhead in incarnate form, walking, entering into the temple. The glorious desire in you and in me of all nations. In the case of the Ten Commandments, it was fear, it was condemnation. In this case, a desire to be found with God's people in God's house. This desire for all things eternal and all things spiritual, they are not by the will of man. They are not by anything that is of this earth. It is from the indwelling of the Spirit of God in your heart. I pray and hope that your desire is sincere and genuine. The desire for the study of God's Word, the desire to come and pray together, the desire for worship, the desire for the study of God's Word. All the Christian things and activities that you never, never had any desire for before salvation. You were either completely indifferent to them or you might even despise them and mock them. But now, they become the very fabric of your life and your existence. You don't come to church for any ulterior motive or any earthly benefit, not for the expansion of your business or to get something out of it so that you could have maybe find a life partner or get your child into the kindergarten for whatever all these materialistic ulterior motive, earthly reasons, but purely spiritual, purely for the sake of Christ. You sacrifice, you take the trouble to come, you put it as a priority in your life, as part and parcel of your life, indispensable, that you will not uh, give it up. It will be at the top of your priority as something that is non-negotiable. You know, I know some of you will make sure that the annual church camp is something that is non-negotiable in your calendar when you plan for your family, your family's activities. Because you have tasted and experienced what benefit and spiritual blessing there is to shut yourself out from the world and to be with God's people morning, noon and night. To be with the family of God knowing that one day it will be an eternal experience in a new location called new heaven and new earth. A desire that is inexplicable, can't be explained. You just have to feel it and experience it to know it. That desire, and it is, the Bible says, global, all nations, doesn't matter whether you are of this particular culture, this particular language. Are we not experiencing that? Are we not seeing that? Do you not see yourself as a fulfillment of this argument that God himself had presented to the people in Haggai's time? That we are the fulfillment of this argument, this blessing. We live in a world that is so three-dimensional. We need to pray and ask God to open our spiritual eyes bigger and to open it more. To see beyond the three-dimensional into the spiritual realm. Because that's exactly what God wanted the people to see. Don't see the glory that is based upon the three-dimensional like the Solomonic Temple. Soon after Solomon completed that temple, he started to fall into sin, great sin. 
And that glorious temple was not very glorious other than the physical and external in terms of the brightness of the grandeur of the gold. But other than that, in terms of the spiritual, when you study the books of First and Second Kings, add on to it First and Second Chronicles, you realize that they place idols inside, they strip the gold and they replace it with brass, polish it to make it look as if it is still gold because they have to take it and they use it as payment for mercenaries to help them fight their battles. It was shameful. The glory that was external was not that glorious. We have to see beyond the three-dimensional. And that's what God wanted them to see through the instruction of Haggai. The greater glory is not going to be measured by earthly material anymore. The global nature of it, the impact, but the desire that is found in your heart and in my heart is because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did. What this particular generation was challenged to do is the same for every generation. And all of them must do their part in order for the culmination of the first coming of Jesus Christ to be a reality in the fullness of the fulfillment of all the prophecies that God has given concerning Christ's first coming. Abraham did his part, so did Isaac, so did Jacob. 430 years later, so did Moses. And that generation did their part in building the tabernacle. Every generation will have to do their part. Solomon did his part in building the temple. Everyone. And now Haggai is challenging his generation to do your part in the reconstruction of the temple, but see beyond the three-dimensional physical building and see the spiritual. And the third and final argument we see from verse 8 and verse 9 the first argument being the universal perspective, the second argument being the glorious desire that is global in nature, and then verse 8 and verse 9, the spiritual standard that we have already mentioned. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. That's the spiritual standard that the Lord is pointing them to. Said the Lord of hosts, and in this place shall I give peace, said the Lord of hosts. What peace? The God of peace, the Lord Jesus Christ the Saviour of the world, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It is through His sacrifice that we make peace with God. The entire Levitical system culminates in the peace. You know the sequence of their offerings that the Lord has revealed to His people? They must begin their offering with a sin offering, which is for purification. To purify all the altars and all the items before they can be clean and acceptable and holy in God's sight. And then after that, they offer burnt offering. Burnt offering is always for the atonement of sin. And now that your sins have been atoned, what is the next offering? You guess, peace offering. Now that you have peace with God. And the final offering, now that you have peace with God, what do you do? Thank offering. That's a sequence. Purification of the items, atonement of sin, peace with God, give thanks. That's the sequence. And that's what the Lord taught Moses when he consecrated Aaron and the priesthood in Leviticus chapter 9. That's the sequence. And so you can imagine whenever they consecrate a priest to begin his ministry at the age of 30, this would be the sequence. Sin offering, burnt offering, peace offering, thank offering. And thank offering is a wave offering where everybody will be able to see as their gesture of thanking the Lord. Peace. You know how wonderful it is to have peace with God? We were enemies. Enemies don't have peace. You know that. You see this. Russia and Ukraine, they have no peace. They are enemies. Literally, they are, they are mortal and they are fighting and killing one another in the thousands. Enemies. And now God says, in this temple, I will give peace, said the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts who cannot lie. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, who had planned for the existence of Israel as far back as Abraham. 
the Lord of hosts, who gave man the first gospel as far back as Genesis 3.15. And the Lord of hosts is continuing his plan of salvation for mankind in the generation of Haggai, challenging them, you have to do your part. But see beyond the three-dimensional and into the spiritual, that what you are doing is critical. It will culminate in the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ where this place, God says, is a place where I will bring peace. But the Lord Jesus Christ himself will enter. And you and I know from the Gospels the impact of this temple and what Jesus Christ did when they turned it into a den of thieves using the sincerity of the people who want to worship the Lord and then they make merchandise of them, they make it a profitable business out of them. Jesus was not against the money changers or them selling clean animals outside the temple precinct. They were necessary. The problem was the exorbitant interest that these traders, these money changers, where they took advantage of the worshippers. When a person worshipped, living in Galilee. He will not bring a clean animal because by the time he arrived, the unblemished clean animal would probably be wounded, injured, blemished. And so they will bring the money. How much it will cost in Galilee to buy or to purchase an unblemished sheep, one year old, male, let's say. And so you put into your pocket the amount of money you want to worship the Lord, you want to give thanks to the Lord. Or if you are richer, a few animals. And so when you arrive in Jerusalem, all these traders and money changers know that you need to buy a clean animal from them, otherwise your long travel all the way down would be fruitless, futile. So you are desperate, you need to buy a clean animal for worship. So they know you are desperate. And so they took advantage of your desperate desire to having traveled so many days just to arrive here to worship the Lord. And so these people took advantage. And those who want to give their free will offering to the Lord, they can't give the Roman coin with the Caesar's head on it. They have to convert it to their shekel, which used to be their national currency, but now they're under the yoke of Rome. They turn it into a temple currency. And so Gentiles will not use your shekel. It's useless for business but it is very, very useful, the only currency that could be used for offering to God. And again, the money changer will take advantage. And that's why the Lord drove them out, very angry. You turned my father's house into a den of thieves. You take advantage of the sincerity of my people to worship the Lord, and you make money out of them. The temple played a very important part right up to the very final moment when the Lord Jesus Christ breathed his last breath and he committed his spirit to the Lord at his death. Remember how the veil was torn from top to bottom? The Lord still recognized the temple. Very significant message. The veil was torn from top to bottom, signifying to us now all of us can have direct access before God's throne of grace in heaven through the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire Levitical system will now be put aside, fulfilled, because the reality of Jesus Christ's death, which the entire Levitical system was a type of, has now been fulfilled. The reality has come. You do not need the negative, like a picture. That's why this is so significant. The spiritual perspective see the spiritual perspective and not the three-dimensional. And as long as you do not see the spiritual perspective in what you do, our attitude toward what we do and what we serve will be like what the generation of Haggai feel like. It's so insignificant compared to the first. So why do we want to do it? Why do it? It's not as grand as the previous one. What I'm doing is so insignificant, nobody will notice. What's the point? You and I have been taught that in the New Testament, the Lord will measure what we do based upon faithfulness, 
which is true. But very often, we do not understand what that means. Faithfulness. Is it something that is great and grand to serve the Lord in folding the church bulletin on a very, very regular weekly basis? Every Saturday evening, now that we all can come back, we need people to do the folding. What is so great about folding the bulletin? But you know that on the day of worship, when we enter the sanctuary for worship, you know how useful the bulletin is? If it is not folded nicely, just imagine all of us just stand there, taking piece by piece, piece by piece. You know how messy that is? But because there were some people who folded it, it is our worship. It becomes so convenient for us to worship so that we come in, there is as little distraction as possible. But what's so great about folding pieces of paper, isn't it? You may argue. See the spiritual. See the spiritual. You know, sometimes we think that, well, we are not teachers in front of a class. We are not from the pulpit preaching God's word. These are spiritual. Well, all the things that we do are not. See beyond the three dimensional. Certain ministries may thrust certain individuals in the limelight. It doesn't mean that they are the only ones who can do spiritual. You and I are doing spiritual work because you are spiritual. Therefore, everything you do is spiritual. Stop measuring it by the standard of the world in terms of the three dimensional. Jesus says, even as simple as giving someone a cup of cold water in my name, you will not lose your reward. That's spiritual. That's what Jesus meant. How much effort is there to give someone a cup of cold water? Pour into a glass and you put there. I thank those people who fill up the glass. Sunday after Sunday. Used to be our brother Stephen Lee. During church camp, he will always come up and ask me, do you need some water before I go up to speak? Very, very, very considerate. He thinks of all these little, little things. Many of us don't. He does. He's very, very careful and sensitive to this. And I thank God for the many, many occasions that I remember at church camp. He's the only one who always asks me. Literally, he's the only one. Nobody else does except him. On his own, you'll come. You need some water. And then when he prepared in advance, underneath the lectern, the pulpit, there's some water there. It's for you. Please use it. He will tell me. I didn't ask him to do it. He just did it on his own. See beyond the three-dimensional in what you do. Don't play the piano to please man. Play it to serve the Lord. Same with the organ. Same with the PA. Everything that we do. That's what this is all about, this passage. Because we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's why the work is great and glorious. The work that you do for the Lord Jesus Christ is greater and more glorious than any champion, any grand or multi-billion dollar building or structure, whatever the world may put on a pedestal. Tallest building costs how many billions? Look at the engineering marvel of this, what? Longest bridge in the world using tensile, tensile strength, using cables only. How magnificent and grand and glorious. Nothing compared to you offering someone a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. And Jesus says, compared with that structure that is so great and so grand in the eyes of the world, what you did, with that simple glass of water, I will remember for eternity. That structure will be destroyed when I destroy this world. The spiritual perspective must never be forgotten. You'll give a track to a total stranger. You visit a home. The person may not appreciate it. It doesn't matter. You are constrained by the love of your Savior and you do it for Jesus' sake. The spiritual perspective don't forget that. And that's what God wanted Haggai to tell the people. And these are the words of the Lord of hosts. Your Jehovah, your God, is now telling you, you are my people and I am your God and you are serving me and this temple will have a spiritual significance 
that I will remember for eternity. Build it. Give your best. And don't measure it using the standards of the world in your own personal life as well. You may not be recognized by the world. You may not have all the education with all the titles of the world, but you go to work as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a servant of the Most High God, as a bearer of the key to the heaven that Jesus Christ came to usher us into the gospel. It's the key. You know that, right? And you share the gospel by way of the life of holiness. That is a spiritual, precious service that the Lord will remember forever and ever. So do not sell yourself short and don't enter into your places of work bearing in mind the titles of the world. You have a PhD in this. You are now given the title of CEO, general manager, whatever it is. Don't ever see yourself through the eyes of the world, but the eyes of your Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you will never forget the spiritual perspective in what you do. It's more than just simply when you are teaching the Bible, preaching the Word of God, then it is spiritual. Everything else is not. Everything else is even as simple as vacuuming, washing, cooking, ironing, all the simple things. You do it for Christ as a child of God, as a servant of God, with joy, with gladness. There is nothing mundane, nothing that is boring when you do all things with a spiritual perspective for Jesus' sake. Do you know that? And that's what Haggai must impress into the people to spur them on, to keep the fire burning, the desire to complete the temple. Chapter 1, the people were all motivated. 30 days later, the Lord appeared to Haggai and to tell them again, get the people to go beyond the motivation into action. And that's what this passage is about. The second message. The third message will come from verse 10 onwards, and then the fourth message will be from verse 20 onwards. The third message will be 58 days later from the beginning. And then the fourth message is on the same day. Two messages, short ones, but significant and important enough. And to remind all of us that whatever you do, constrained by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, bear in mind, it is the greatest work that you could ever do on this earth. The greatest and the glorious. Because everything else will be burned and be destroyed, except that which you have done for Jesus' sake, because of your love for Him. So let this be our one and only motive, because only God's children can have this one and only motive. And we are the only ones who can have this motive, whereby what we do will have a grand, glorious nature in what we do. Why do we do it? Why do we discard it? Why do we replace it with something that is earthly, something that is carnal, something that is going to be destroyed? That is foolish, don't you agree? Unbelievers can't even if they want to. We can, and then we don't. Isn't that foolishness? That we can be motivated by the love of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, to spur us on not to give up until the very last breath. For Jesus' sake, you don't recognise me, you don't pat me on the back, you don't say anything nice, never thank you, it's okay. For Jesus' sake, that spurs us on and that must keep us going. And we give our very best and at the end of it, we just say to the Lord, Lord, we are only unprofitable servants after all that you have done for me. This is the least that I can do in return, to return this life back to you in service. 
Do you know how wonderful a life you would have? So rich and so full and so abundant. But you literally stop measuring yourself by the abundance of what you possess, but only a closer walk with your Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. The greater glory of God's house, because of the universal perspective, the glorious global desire of the nations of the world, and you and I are included. And the spiritual perspective standard that the Lord says, I'm going to look at this temple, and I'm going to look at your life and your work. You know, churches today, they boast about how many thousands of people join them and enter their church. Their church are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The world will be impressed. The world will be impressed based upon their own standard. We should not be. Sure, we want people to come. We want people to be blessed. We want people to come to know Christ. But we must never take pride in such things. That's foolishness. A spiritual standard is the only standard that matters for eternity. Don't lose it. Don't forget it. Don't exchange it. Only truly born-again believers can possess it. Hold on to it and serve the Lord with this perspective all the days of your life for God's people's blessing and for God's glory. Let us pray. Our merciful, loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise Thee, O God, for Thy goodness, Thy grace, and Thy mercies in saving us and leaving us behind on this earth where we can serve Thee. But this life can be used by Thee, O Lord, to bring blessing to sinners in the world who are without the Saviour. Send us forth, O Lord. May we never forget our spiritual duty and responsibilities to the sinners that you have brought into our lives, how they need to see Christ in us and how they need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to save them. We thank thee, Father, that we can also be a blessing to fellow believers to help one another to live for the Lord Jesus Christ in godliness, in holiness, in righteousness, according to scriptures. And through the service that we are able to serve one another, may we always give our very best unto thee as sons and daughters of the Most High God, serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords, even our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we always give our very best, seeking only to promote him, for he must increase and we decrease in our lives, for we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And may our good works point many to the Saviour and glorify our Father who art in heaven. Bless us, O Lord, as we break off into our respective groups for our prayer. In Jesus' most precious and holy name, we give thanks and pray. Amen. God bless. Any Praise or prayer items, anyone like to share with us? If not, we shall break off into our groups. Thank you.